So hello everyone. Uh, great to see you all here this morning again, uh, at least in Tallinn. So I'm, I'm a bit in a travel mode uh, at the moment. Uh, but uh, let's give another minute for everyone to join. But today, guys, uh, we'll be speaking about uh, um, practical, some practical topics regarding Gen AI uh, and how to use it in your business operations, what kind of strategies uh, to apply, what kind of risks we should consider. And before we jump in, I would like to introduce our amazing guest and a friend of mine, uh, Shahab Ambar Jafari. Shahab, uh, please give us maybe uh, a couple of minutes intro of why you're here, what, what's, what's, what's great about you being here. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, it's such an honor to be here. So um, Shahab is my name. I am um, Chief Data Scientist and Director of AI in PricewaterhouseCooper, PwC Finland. I am actually leading AI and Gen AI initiatives with PwC MA Aux, and I'm one of the driving force of responsible AI with, with PwC Global. Um, prior to the PwC, I have been working in academia. So I am coming from an academic background, have been working in the field of um, artificial intelligence as a scientist for 19 years. In particular, in the past uh, six, seven years, I have been working into responsible AI and now more towards the generative AI and its application. Awesome. Uh, maybe before we actually jump into that, uh, I think we'll cover this uh, topic later as well, but can you kind of uh, elaborate a bit of responsible AI? What does it entail? Yeah, there is this big, big uh, uh, buzz and fear regarding to the AI may may uh, eliminate our jobs, taking over and, and things like that. So the responsible AI is focusing on the risks of AI and try to make sure that all the AI development that we are conducting, no matter if you are doing a contract management or you are doing a financial tech or if you are doing a biometric, they will be all within their regulations and aiming to reduce the risk and help humanity with our daily jobs. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Shahab. Well, great to have you here. And I'm Jean Maurice. I'm co-founder and head of product of Avocada. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, kind of looking from like my perspective and Avocada's perspective, probably AI is, of course, a huge and hot topic. But there are some controversial things uh, uh, around AI as well that I would like to uh, kind of touch at least uh, for uh, our audience to maybe understand uh, uh, practicalities, uh, practicalities uh, regarding this deeper. And the first actually thing uh, that I would like to discuss is a super basic thing because um, uh, some time ago, I did a poll uh, inside the Avocado team as well, asking them like this question, guys, do you know what GPT stands for in chat GPT? And in the, even in our team, like 30% of people kind of wondered, no, we actually don't know what it stands for. Everybody knows what LLM stands for, right? Uh, large language model, right? And uh, uh, But GPT puts us kind of into, okay, what, what does it mean? So I run the same poll on my LinkedIn page as well. Uh, of course, it wasn't like hundreds of people, but uh, uh, like more than like 20 people replied to that. And I was like, again, surprised that half of like uh, LinkedIn network also doesn't know what GT GPT stands for. And uh, Shahab, maybe you can elaborate what it is, what it stands for and why huh. it's, it's, it's important. Well, it's important to know because the moment you know it, you have a better understanding how, how it works. The GPT stands for, for Generative Pre-trained Transformers. And Transformers are um, a network architecture which has been introduced initially by, by Google in 20, 2017, which is creating the, the whole hype of estimating what is the next thing, like next word, next frame, next uh, 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 pixels, and so on and so forth. And it is um, generative because it is predicting the next statement. It is pre-trained, as you know, that they have been trained over billions of data points. And it is transformer in the sense of it is using the transformer structure or infrastructure in order to, to have it. So this is where the GPT comes. And it starts to become the word to call in a sense that chat GPT became a commercial term and the GPT was in inside it. So the chat GPT means chat with this generative pre-trained uh, 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 transform. 
Okay, that's that's actually very important stuff because uh, when I was explaining AI uh, to people that are not that techy, they they really see it as a bit of a magic, you know, a black box where you look at and you ask a question and it actually responds, and the response looks like it's it's sentient being on the other uh, on the other uh, uh, side of the screen. But actually, the idea uh, about the chat GPT and LLM models, they predict the next word in the sentence. And then they predict the next sentence. And then they predict the next paragraph. And that's how things are built. So it doesn't think in the way we kind of human beings are thinking, analyzing some kind of data. They just predict the word after word and sentence after sentence. And that's, that's important to understand because uh, there is no... Um, I, I call it like intelligence, uh, so to speak, because it just been pre-trained and it generate the most uh, popular next word or next sentence that goes in the specific context. That's that's the very important thing. When you realize that, you understand that like what 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 it entails. You need to train the model, right? So that's that that's important. And it's like very basic, but it's very interesting how people are missing this part and think that there is some kind of intelligence behind that that actually solves the problem or does the, does the job. Because like one plus one for chat GPT is not an equation to be solved. It's not like that. It's not adding one to one. It just predicts that like in vast majority of the cases, one plus one follows by equals two, right? But kind of if you, if you train it enough that one plus one actually equals to three, it will predict a three at some point. But of course, it's it's not possible. I'm just like isn't saying. It, isn't it similar to, to how our brain is, is, is working? And uh, because we are not really having the zero and one bits and adding it and, and logically come one plus one is one zero, which is number two. We, we learn one plus one is equal to two and it kind of goes into our, our subconscious and we have it. Okay. Uh, by the way, some housekeeping rules, guys. Uh, we do not want it to be uh, like, you know, uh, one way street, right? That me and Shahab, we are just talking and then you were just listening in. So that's why, first of all, uh, we just launched a poll. Um, so take a look and uh, uh, mark your answer. We'll discuss it later. Does your organization already um, use this AI? And by organization, I mean not you personally use AI for like your personal gains or what's not, but does your organization uh, use it? It's, it's very interesting to understand how uh, people are looking uh, from an organizational level to AI deployment. And of course, we will have several uh, sections throughout the whole webinar where we will address your questions, guys. So I suggest you can ask any question and we will try to answer it both uh, I and Shahab, uh, uh, anything related to the topic of today's conversation, everything and anything you would like to know, please use Q&A uh, and uh, we will get to it at some point in time. So the next thing, uh, Shahab, I, I wanted to discuss is uh, kind of when organization uh, organizations are looking at AI, and people are looking at AI, especially Gen AI, uh, most of the time we kind of see the pattern that they see it as an isolated thing, just like we need to take some kind of model and then it will start operating, right? Start, start solving the problem. So, uh, but it's much bigger, right? So there is a whole like set of building blocks you need to understand in order to deploy, right? Absolutely, absolutely correct. Actually, um... In PwC, one of the very important steps that, that we are usually doing is that we are focusing a lot on the generative. Let's focus on generative AI because AI is huge and we want to, to talk about generative AI. Conduct a generative AI strategy. The, in, within the generative AI strategy, uh, we are trying to find out what are the use cases, define the priority over the use cases, and when we are defining the priority, what are the impact it introduced to the, to the business, what are the costs associated to that one, and whether even it's feasible with the, today's technology that we need, we need to do and so. Because we, will, we are seeing that there are lots of issues and limitations which are associated to the, to the LLMs and MLLMs, multimodal LLMs, which are, which are in the market, and we have to be aware of it while we are defining the, the use cases. Okay. And actually, in this specific uh, on this specific picture, uh, that kind of we we talk about like uh, LLM is this like small part, small block here. Of course, it's like small in this particular thing. Of course, it's big and important. But I think what's also underestimated is uh, this part called data sources. And I added it there 
because uh, uh, how LLMs works, Shahab, you can elaborate, is they, of course, need data. Of course, there are pre-trained models and uh, uh, trained model on your data. But what what what's, is the most important in this data source block? Absolutely. So let's look at the LLM like a very smart person who goes to the university and even get a PhD and studied lots of things. And then you hire him or her into your company. For the simplicity, uh, simplicity, I use he. So, so you hire him into into your your company, but still, you need to give your data, your client data, very specific tools that you are using. So, from huge amount of knowledge that he has, he quickly adopted and start to utilize it in your own uh, uh, um, benefits and so on. So, literally, this is this is what the the LLM is is doing. And one other thing I really love about this picture that you put is. The, the box of LLM, it's very important for people to understand there are a huge amount of things. I always, when I'm talking, I say that LLM is like this magnificent engine of a Rolls Royce, a 12 cylinder, amazing master mechanical masterpiece. However, if, I, if you're hold, if, if you are powerful enough to hold that heavy engine, it still you cannot move even a meter. You need to have the chassis, you need to have the wheel, you need to have the windshield, you need to have the body, you need to have lots of things so you can benefit from this amazing engine. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And one thing that I also would like uh, you to elaborate a bit about the data sources, because sometimes we see, uh, especially on the, you know, companies and organizations uh, are taking first steps in uh, deploying uh, AI, even like experimenting with AI, they, they kind of... Uh, do not understand that AI doesn't have a long time memory. So it, it doesn't know what the context of your question, if you ask it like today or tomorrow or the day after, they, uh, it, it doesn't know the whole story. So how, how, how it's solved in, in this case. So how do we yeah, yeah. resolve this? The, the generative AIs, as we are speaking, they have a fixed amount of memory, which we call them token size. And of course, as we are speaking, they are improving it. Like around six months ago, the token size was 32,000 a token, which is around 20 pages of word. And now we have four times more, 128K, which means that it can read like hundreds of page. And there are some models like Lama, which is introducing millions of tokens, but still it is limited. However, in the real world, especially if you are a bigger organization, you have huge amounts of data. In order to solve this problem, we usually have a set of algorithm, which is called retrieval augmented generation. Uh, and, and it's called uh, in short form RAG. And we utilize RAG in order to take this huge document that you have, divide it into the chunks, and then read every single chunk. It's like this. There are tens of us in a room, and I have a hundred page of book. So what I do, I divide the book into the 10 segment and I give everyone 10 pages to read. And I only know who has which pages. So if a question comes to me, I know that I have to go to Jian and ask that question or I have to go to Shahab to ask that question because the coming question only exists in those pieces. This creating this, we call it vectorization of database, RAG is a way in order to handle this memory issue. That's an amazing explanation. I, I couldn't explain that because I was trying to explain it to a friend of mine. How does it work and how this like short term memory being addressed in, in, in this terms. But what it gives us actually looking at this picture, and that's what I wanted to emphasize for everyone who is looking into deployment of AI on an organizational level. It's not a silo technology that exists somewhere and solves some problems. So it's a connected to all the systems. Of course, it should have some cloud computing infrastructure available for that, depending on the uh, model you use or the model you train yourself. It should have like uh, proper, clean data sources. And of course, it's all connected to your existing infrastructure where the data kind of being born, being, being held. And of course, there is a platform that orchestrates the whole story, right? And there is a user interface, right? So it's it's not one thing that you can just take it and, and put it somewhere and it will start generating any business value. It doesn't work this way. It's much more complex uh, from one thing, but when you know the bits and pieces around <laughs> that, it's not that challenging, so to speak. And of course, when when we talk about like AI, uh, the most popular one probably we all know OpenAI, and uh, this is exactly where ChatGPT lives, right? Uh, but there are other players on the market. So Shahab, maybe you can elaborate a bit uh, about the whole uh, market structure, what's going on in Gen AI at the moment. 
Yeah, uh, it's an extremely competitive market, even when we look at the creation of the LLM. As you stated, OpenAI has the biggest stack, uh, naturally due to the huge amount of investment they have received from Microsoft and so on. And But uh, we should not ignore what Google and Meta AI are also introducing with the Gemini and with the, with the Llama models. In parallel to them, we are we are aware of the company called Anthropic, which has this cloud tree, and it has one of the best model called Opus. But um, if you are following the news, you know that on daily basis, these things, the statistics are are changing and numbers are changing. We are seeing that there we are having huge movement towards something which we call them MLLMs, multimodal large language models. And in there, uh, uh, G, uh, the OpenAI introduced the GPT-40. And at the same time, Google uh, two two days afterwards introduced Gemini 1.5 Flash, and uh, Llama introduced. I mean, Meta introduced Llama 3. They are all having huge amount of um, uh, a token size, dealing with uh, not only text but uh, voices, videos, and images, and so on and so forth. But it doesn't mean that the world is is finished into that one. For example, Baidu has this. Erne, they introduced the last version of it, I think, as slightly less than a year ago. So, which have like I don't know, huge amount of user, in particular in the in uh, 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 China are using it. Uh, it's uh, in the if you are you if you are an AWS lover, you know that um, Amazon SageMaker have several models. For example, they have Falcons. They have multiple version of it. It has been introduced by Technology in, uh, uh, Innovation Institute. Uh, Falcon 40B is like huge model, but they have the smaller models, which are which are also also um, existing. Of course, as we are speaking, some of the models start to be discontinued, like GPT-3 is being discontinued. This morning when I woke up, I saw that uh, Google sent an email that uh, a Gemini 1.0 is also being, being discontinued and so on and so forth. There are many other uh, a smaller model, which is like, like Mistral, Orca, Palm. I mean, I'm not, I'm not using them because many of them are heavily focused on, for instance, English language only, like Falcon. So that's why that it's not necessarily a very optimal thing for many of the cases that in PwC we are seeing and we are, we are playing around with them. But there are there are many more, as you can see in the slides that 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 you have. Yeah, uh, de definitely. Basically, wh when you think about AI, do not think about ChatGPT. There are many other models. So kind of take a look, do do your research, and see what fits best for your use case. And now, uh, guys, the next topic we'll discuss uh, a bit, and then we will we we will jump into QA and see the poll results at the moment. So if you want uh, your questions uh, to be answered uh, after the next uh, topic. Just feel free to ask them in Q and A section. We'll take a look in a moment there. But the next thing, I, I'm, I'm kind of, uh, I'll play a bad cup here, right? So uh, you'll play a good cup. Uh, I'll play a bad one. And there is a hype cycle curve. Uh, it was presented by Gartner, and basically every technology starts with this like hype cycle. It goes up and up and up and up, and then uh, it reaches its peak, and then it slides down, uh, and then after that, it kind of. Uh, uh, goes into the sustainable mo mode where we see the how technology actually generate value. So, Shahab, are we here with Gen AI? Uh, okay, uh, very good. It's actually this this curve is very famous for any sorts of disruptive technology. We saw this curve in eighties happen with the personal computers. In two thousand happened with the uh, Web two e commerce. Amazon was leading it. Uh, we saw it in in twenty ten with the mobile and social media, and in twenty twenty we are seeing it with the generative AI. And I think it's very personalized. Different people can be on different part of this curve. But if you look at it from industrial perspective, it seems we are maybe a little bit if, uh, before we are still rising. The hype is is continuing especially when you are seeing the big names are talking and say that, hey, you call it hype. The reality is that still it is under hype. The bigger hype is yet, yet to come. So I agree with you about this, this care, but I think that we are still more to go up before it starts to, so to be. We are somewhere more, here, uh, right? So on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, okay. My personal opinion is that we are around there. Good. 
uh, and then what happens actually when we will get here? What, what do you think will happen when when this like disappointment will come eventually to some extent? Of course, that this dip might be like bigger, or smaller, it doesn't matter. But what happens? Who will survive? What kind of uh, applications will keep delivering value? What's what's your opinion? It's not question of which application will survive and so on. It's this dislike happens when your level of expectation is above what a system would deliver. Uh, I have shown this graph many times and I always have gave this example that, hey, when you are starting a new relationship with a person, we, we as a human also in our relationship follow this one. At the beginning, there are lots of butterfly around the stomach. Everything is so beautiful until we find out a little bit of the red flags. The person doesn't like this type of food. He is snoring when he is sleeping and those type of things. But however, what happens if you are you are giving more chance, you are managing your expectation, it will actually end up to become maybe very, very, very healthy. So generally, I different forms a lot, and we have observed how many times, for example, it does hallucination, it does many other things. So the dislike is happening, but in defense of it, it does huge amount of beautiful thing. That's okay that it fails a few things. So that bottom part of the curve is is the part in the roller coaster of this AI that we are starting to manage our expectation. Yeah, we are not expecting a fish to fly, for instance. That, 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 that's exactly my point. And that's exactly why we started from this like basics, what GPT stands for, HGPT, right? So, and uh, that's a, it's a prediction model, so to speak. So, uh, that kind of wraps up the generic block. Where, where do we stand in terms of like uh, generative AI? And uh, we discussed many interesting things. And uh, I will close the poll. And actually, I'm seeing that 54% uh, uh, replied that they use. AI in the organization, and that's that's quite uh, quite a good result. There are still 20 uh, 20 percent, a bit above 20 percent that are not using, but planning to use it. Uh, like uh, there are people that are using it personally, so it means the organization doesn't uh, deploy it, uh, deploy AI at the moment, but people are still using that. And uh, there are just a few people uh, saying that no and no plans, or I'm not sure. But that's good. That's promising. That's actually uh, proves your point, Shahab, that we are not there yet in terms of like her, because like there is so there are so many organizations that are still, uh, let's say, looking to adopt uh, it, and at least half of them probably are not there yet. So uh, I will launch the next poll, guys. So the next poll is about risks. Uh, so take a look at the list of the risks there. Of course, you 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 kind of uh, need to pick one, uh, but we believe that uh, there are so many of them, uh, just prioritize uh, what, what, which particular risk uh, is uh, uh, relevant for your organization. And we will take a look uh, uh, a bit later when we will be discussing risks uh, uh, of uh, generative AI and we'll be diving into this one. But as promised, uh, during the, the introduction of our webinar in, in the description, we want it to be practical. So you take not only like some fun stuff and where are we in terms of Gen AI, but also some kind of like a very simple, uh, but of course, general roadmap. How do you deploy AI inside a, an organization and how to do it constantly and uh, at scale? And for that, we designed, uh, it's not just like super kind of know-how, but we designed like an eight-step AI implementation framework. Uh, it's a pretty simple one, but I believe uh, uh, you can elaborate. Uh, we can elaborate kind of uh, step by step with uh, uh, Yusha Hub, starting from the first one, right? Yeah, um, as I stated in, in in PwC, in particular in PwC Finland, which I'm heavily uh, uh, involved. Uh, the first step is this um, Gen AI strategy, which we are defining what are the need and goals for the business. And then we are listing the, the uh, use cases. And then we define the priority over, over those use cases. Let's say that we did with your organization and we find 12 use cases and we give a priority to three of them. Then this is the, the beginning of the journey because what then we have to do is, okay, 
Do we have the data? Even if we have the data, can we use that data? Because many of the data based on the nature of the, the organization are subject to the GDPR data, many other data privacy clauses and so on and so forth. Once it is all known, then we can start to actually create a, 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 a POC within the step two and so. Once the POC is there so we can see the value, then we start to go to the rest of the cycle, which is focusing on how to scale this AI, how to start to, to deploy this one. What type of platform do we need to use? Some clients are heavily Microsoft focused, so they have everything in Azure, so we have to develop in Azure. We have clients which are AWS focused, so everything needs to be done in, in AWS and so on and so forth. Then we have GCP, we have local resources and so on. One thing which is very, very essential is we need to conduct huge amount of experiments with the real data in the production, collect feedback and, and, and uh, 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 kind of uh, uh, iterate. Because you know that the new language of programming is prompting. And prompting is like art of asking the right question. And usually we are talking about huge lines of prompt. And it get fine tuned as we are iterating, as we are seeing the cases that it generate, and it's not not desired. And usually we have a poll of independent experts which are evaluating and assessing. So a step five, six, seven for us at this in PwC is a big loop that when we go to the production, we are we are uh, kind of repeating it a lot. And of course, for businesses such as yours, such as ours. It's very important to look into this concept of intellectual property when we are creating it. What is the unique advantage that we are introducing? Uh, as I stated, asking the question is an art, and now there are IPs around this art which is being generated. So you are kind of protecting the way that you are asking questions. And I hope that the audience understands uh, when I say asking questions, we are not talking about 12 character and one question mark. Typically, we are talking about sometimes a page of writing of the, the prompt, make it very specific in order to do a particular task. So passing it back to you, because I would like to hear your own thoughts also, Gian, on this on these eight steps. Yeah, that, that's exactly the point. There are several things that uh, uh, sometimes keep missing, and we did uh, several mistakes as well. So uh, we will talk about maybe Avocado uh, deploying AI uh, uh, a bit later in this webinar. But looking at this thing, what most important for me is definitely number one. So what, what's the business case? What's the problem that you are actually trying to solve? And then even when you define the problem good enough, you can understand does this like model that predicts words can help you with this particular problem. And then for sure, experiment with non-sensitive data, but try to get this data as to as close to the real data. Because what we where we kind of uh, failed a bit, we experimented a lot and we get to like 90% precision with a test data. But then when we launch it in real data, we realized that the, re the difference, the gap between the test data and the real data is so huge that it was like, okay, now we need to realign uh, everything pretty much. And one thing that I wanted also to uh, mention about like three and four, they go uh, pretty much, uh, they go pretty much together. And what I mean here by defining a scale for AI deployment is uh, basically how many like people, documents, questions, prompts, whatever you are doing there, you will be actually using daily, hourly, every minute, uh, it depends on, of course, on the use case because it affects how, what kind of platform do you need, how you will deploy the model, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, this, this, what Yusha Hub said, I completely agree about five, six, seven being a constant loop. But what I also suggest, like it's being a constant loop in a specific business case. Like, for example, we have business case one and we are kind of improving this model constantly. But to deploy AI throughout the like, different business units and throughout the whole organization, you need to repeat the whole process. Like basically then you kind of you have established everything and then you define the next business case, right? You define the next business case and you see, you experiment again and you see, does uh, your platform that you selected support this particular business case and you need to do some improvements and then you experiment and experiment and experiment. I believe this is this is the key for any, let's say, innovation as well, that you can, if you can't miss any of those steps, to be honest, because if you miss uh, some of them, at some point you will face a wall or a problem or like you can't scale or it actually doesn't work the way you're supposed it to work. Because at every single point, you 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 kind of defining some business requirements and getting some 
uh, data out of the model uh, uh, as well. So uh, I believe this is kind of, uh, guys, a very practical thing, right? But another practical thing that I would like to uh, for us to take a look as um, how basically how businesses, at least uh, how we see it, should make a decision, either use uh, Gen AI or supported by human or completely controlled by humans. So, and uh, we created this like very simple uh, matrix here that kind of uh, in the bottom, we have a cost of error. That's the main uh, variable inside the whole story. So the lower the cost of error, the more you can uh, give action to AI. So AI can do actions for you if the cost of error is super low. The higher the cost of error, the less action should be done by AI, but still you can implement AI to use, uh, to suggest you as a user, as a human being <clears throat> to do a particular action. What do you think about that, uh, Shahab? No, no, absolutely, absolutely correct. And um, the EU AI Act and many of the regulatories are actually designed around this graph that, that you are showing. The things which are more sensitive and there are, uh, cost of error as per se is high there should be more human in the loop and less of the ai involvement and the ones that are more routine and the cost of the error is very uh, negligible or there isn't anything inside it this is where the ai can actually play a very very important role mm -hmm. okay before we jump into the next one, because the next one, again, this was like two practical slides, guys. You can take it and start using them, these eight steps or this uh, uh, particular matrix to identify where each particular thing uh, uh, is on this matrix. Do, 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 uh, can you use AI to actually do actions or should there be, uh, should it have be overseen by a human being? So it's up to you. But uh, I see that we have a question actually here. Let me read the question. Uh, some of the AI applications are behind the paywall. Is there fee? Uh, is the free version less accurate or reliable? Uh, if if I need to answer to that one, the answer to me is that depends on what what you are doing. Typically, the free versions are the uh, smaller models. For example, Fal. Uh, I don't know about the pricing of the Falcon, but let's say that Falcon in AWS has this Falcon 1B, Falcon um, uh, 7B, and Fal Falcon 40B. And Falcon 40B has 40 billion parameters, 1B has 1 billion parameters, and so on and so forth. So usually the ones which are free are have the tendency to be either older material or less number of uh, uh, parameter existing. Maybe you want to just modify an email and that one will work very well for you. Or maybe you need to do a, a contract management and you need to be very specific. Then you are using heavier model because you cannot risk of missing one thing because legally can have consequences and so. This is how we are usually choosing in between. Yep. I agree on that one because free version sometimes limited in speed in how many actually prompts you can do. So sometimes uh, it's limited in the data. In the data, uh, uh, how how fresh is the data and what what parameters does it track? So, but it of course depends on the service as well. There are so many AI services right now, and they all use different freemium models. But uh, you can give it a try. They basically always state what's what's in paid version, what's in free version. Uh, so kind of you, you you can see where is the difference. So, but basically, I, I don't want to say that the the free versions are bad, but usually uh, one of the risks with the AI is the concept of the open open source and you need to be aware of it especially with the with the llm models we are talking about billions of data have been fed and it might create some sorts of uh, a bias existence and things like that that you need to be very much aware of it from 1st of january 2026 eu ai act is in action and those topics become extremely important and will be tied to financial uh, fines okay uh, and we have another question we can take one as well so what kind of AI do you think a higher educational institution can implement to improve support to students and increase profits? Oh, that's a quite, quite a broad that's a, one. That's a very, very, very good question. The, more, the day that the, the chat GPT came, I, I made a poll, I mean, like became public for the everyone uh, in, in, in November 2022. Uh, I, I made a post and I said that, Let's have the fingers crossed that this tool will be a big slap into the classical educational systems that we have so that we will focus more onto the creativity rather than memorization of some, some classical and basic things, which you can even 
without the education, you can Google it. And this is what Elon Musk was heavily saying. Why do you go to university? Watch 40 hours of some, some YouTube channel. You can become a master, master of that particular uh, topics and so. So I think that the educational systems, uh, it will take a huge amount of time because there are huge resistivity, unfortunately, uh, in, in there, but uh, can benefit from it in a sense of focusing more on developing new working forces, which are paying more attention on the creativity and creating a new concept rather than creating something repetitive, which AI can do it much, much faster. Like, I don't know, maybe 20 years ago, no, maybe more, 50 years ago, maybe there was more focus on memorization of multiplications and doing addition, all of all of those things. And nowadays it is less. We are focusing a lot that if you can use a calculator, if you can use those type of tools more, so you can spend more of your time in, in a better task, a more creative task. And I think the person who can find that balance, they can actually make a very good money out of it. I agree on that one. I see another question, and that that's a funny one, actually. I, I would like to leave this one to the next uh, Q and A session. Uh, if if you don't mind, we'll we'll, we'll definitely take it. But uh, guys, feel free add your questions. I think it's much more interactive when you ask questions and we kind of actually elaborate on them. But before we go into the next session, I want to end the poll that we have about which risks do you believe are the most important ones, and we have a winner here. Pretty obvious one, security, cyber attacks, open source software. And the second place is like performance and the third place control governance. And that's exactly what we will be discussing right now. And we have this, um, let's say, uh, AI risk categories actually from uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers. And I believe it's your slide actually, Shahab, right? Yes. So uh, maybe you can elaborate because where, where I want us to focus again, as we are limited in time, it's more on the left side and less on the right side, because the right side is like societal. It's more about like the whole planet. Of course, it's super important, but for the practicalities of like daily implementation, uh, I think the left side is like more, more to the ground. Yeah, absolutely. So, so. Um, the the author, I am not the author of the slide series from Price Water or Scooper, but uh, yes, I shared it with you. So in P PwC, I've been working on the concept of responsible AI and put a huge amount of investment since 20, 2017. And uh, in there, uh, we said that, hey, you know what? Let's take all the risks of AI and divide them into two categories. And as you said, one category is focusing on the application level, which majority of the startups companies are focusing a lot and then we have this enterprise and national level which is focused by the government and union there that's why we have uai act gptr uh, gptr and so on and so forth it's like this what will happen if everyone loses their job against against ai this will be a big social problem because the government need to find a way to give salaries and so on and so forth but let's focus on the on the application level. In application level, we are focusing on the on the performance, security, and and control and governments. And if we are focusing on the Gen AI in the performance, we are heavily focusing on the risks of error. You know the hallucination that comes out that hey, uh, you are asking a question, you provide totally a random answer or or the answer which is which is not necessarily correct. There is a bias. We know that um, the due to the material, historical material that have been provided to this large language model, there is a tendency to be a little bit biased towards towards different genders. There, there might be bias into the race and so on and so forth that need to be studied. When it comes to matter of the security, uh, given that we are talking about huge amount of data and we are fine tuning with huge amount of data, nowadays hacking is not a thing. What is very important is something which is called adversarial attack. Adversarial attack means that you will go and change the label of the data. So the machine learns very well, but it learns very, very wrong. It's like that you find a foreigner and you teach a bad word to that foreigner and say that it means thank you. And that foreigner is using that word in the context of thank you, but because he or she has learned it with that label. And uh, this is this can be very, very dangerous. Consider the autonomous vehicle, which, which you know, the, that type of attacks can be very, very uh, big issue. And then when it comes to matter of the control and governance, in particular, majority of the startups need to pay attention to that one. It's very important to, to have clarity and explainability over and, and transparency over the AI, AI model. A lack of this transparency is a big risk because in financial sectors, obviously, you cannot have an algorithm which the algorithm is not explaining why it made particular decision by itself. So when we call 
explainability it doesn't mean that i will call gian and he will explain to me how his algorithm works the algorithm should should work and say that how it made this this uh, um, a particular decision it's question of what if what if your input was something else how would the decision look like and so on and so forth good uh, how, how how would you suggest organization uh, organizations address those like particular risks uh, when they do the deployment what is there some kind of internal policy needs to be built or uh, absolutely absolutely uh, in pwc we have these frameworks which we are looking into uh, a deployment of the solution and we are doing auditing of the data auditing of the algorithm and conducting te test versus the the baselines in a sense that, for example, you want to see if there is a, a gender bias. Let's let's look at that that particular topic. So you are looking at the data that you have used for fine tuning your model, and we try to see that if this this distribution between the genders are almost uniform, so you have equal amount, or you have a bias towards it. Having a bias is not necessarily bad. For instance, let's say that if if you want to develop an algorithm or a solution for for pregnant women, so having more data related to, to the female body uh, and biology makes sense. But overall speaking, we have to look into, into that one. Not only in, into this, what we do, we are testing the algorithm with respect to the test data. We give data which are very focused to the muscularity, data which is very focused to fem, and data which is mixed. And the ideal scenario is that regardless of that, it has to perform all very equally. If we give lots of female tests and it starts to, to act, let's say, more negative and lots of male and it starts to act more positive, then it means that there is a, there is a bias. Of course, we, then the moment you find a bias, the story, you come to the point zero, then now you have to go back and find out that what was the issue. The issue is in the algorithm. You have to change the model. You have to change your data and so on and so forth. Yeah, actually, I remembered one case. Uh, I think we discussed pre before the webinar about the Amazon and this exactly the gender bias they had when they launched uh, screening uh, AI for screening applicants that apply for the job. And what they did actually, and what the problem was, the AI was favoring men. Uh, it was like like completely favoring men. It was like biased towards men. And the problem that they identified actually was in uh, in the uh, initial data set because they they kind of uh, trained the model on uh, 10 years of resumes and uh, applicants uh, data that was mostly from men. So they, they basically, uh, the, the, the data set they used, it was like biased towards man by default. And that's why the model was biased. So they dropped it at some point, they probably re, uh, revived it. Uh, do you have some interesting application stories, uh, uh, deployment stories as well, maybe, Shahab? Like yeah, the, most famous, the most famous example was um, uh, during the COVID time with AstraZeneca. So you know that AstraZeneca vaccine, when it came out, it started to create the, the blood clot for, for females. And then they find out that the test people that they use were majority of them were male and they were not really testing it enough with the female. So they didn't know when it, it was ruled out. They 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 find out that that issue exists with the with the biology. And there are many, many more similar type of examples which are which are existing. And that's why that, as I stated earlier, we have to look at the different type of tests and create the bias and test it and see how it handles. Of course, in case of generative AI. If we find out that, that there is a bias, the good part of it is that with the right prompt, you can get rid of it. Why? We are human and we are learning from lots of material. And let's say that we are learning from lots of uh, biased material, reading the history. There have been lots of things on the muscularity rather than the film. But yes. when we come to do make a decision making, we are giving the prompt to our brain that, hey, there is a gender equality and let's say that we want to, to boost the number of female in the management level, then we say that if there are two people, one male, one female of similar equality, uh, similar quality, because quality obviously matters, then we will prefer the, the female, for instance. So those type of things can be added into the prompt to assure that the equality in the gender, race, and other things are, are being enforced over all, all the data. But if your data is hugely bias, I mean, you cannot really do, you have to go back at the data level. But if the bias is not that bad, then with the, with the prompt, you can assure that that problem will not, will not occur.
Yeah, so more and more we talk, more more and more we get to the prompting. Uh, actually, when we realized that Avocado, what what's the uh, IP for that? But uh, in to to be honest, in Avocado we just deployed AI as well. You know about that. We we kind of uh, talked uh, to Yusha Hub many times about that. So yeah. we we kind of at Avocado we help organization to automate uh, the whole uh, processes of working with documents. Can I pause you? And actually, I'm very much interested to to ask a few questions uh, uh, regarding to that because you refer to to your product. I know a little bit of it, but it might be interesting as a good example for our audience. If you don't mind, I have actually a couple of questions to ask. Sure, of course. So very cool. So so uh, how, so you you are an AI company and you are very good example in Estonia for how you are utilizing generative AI. So how do you choose the moment, the right moment to to deploy the AI? Because I know in your sandbox, I have talked with your team in sandbox. They are doing lots of amazing things, but. But how do you how do you decide that? Okay, what's the right moment to do the the, the deployment? That, 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 that's a great question. And I believe it was the biggest challenge for us as well, because kind of we, we heard about Gen AI, like when, when it started to kind of go, go, uh, go into the hype. So for quite some time, and we are, you know, we're, we're walking around this Gen AI and looking from one perspective, from another perspective. But then we realized at some point that before we can deploy uh, AI successfully, first of all, we need to understand the problem we are solving, right? And um, what's the problem for our uh, current customers, our like users, right? So, and uh, we looked at how they use our existing product and we asked them, we did a lot of interviews with our customers, like asking simple question, guys, kind of you, you, you know, the avocado platform, right? You automate your people operations, revenue operations, whatever, right? So what, what's, what's missing? And then at some point we realized what's missing is that like before avocado, they have a legacy, right? So, and uh, after avocado, everything automated, everything online, before avocado, you have a lot of legacy documents. And legacy documents, that's a data set that we can actually use to start uh, extracting the business critical data from the previous uh, documents and previous contracts. But to deploy it, we need to build a framework where you can define which data is relevant for you, right? Because kind of uh, the better you prompt, the better data you get. So, and before we deployed AI, we actually deployed this like data framework where you can define which fields are you interested in. Okay, we as a company interested in this and that and this and that. And then you just like upload all the data and then we use AI to extract this data from there. So that's that was the point when we realized, yeah, we can now cover much bigger use case for our customers uh, addressing uh, the, the existing documents and contracts they have before they kind of uh, start using Avocado. That was the point. And kind of now we are in... Uh, public beta, so to speak. So some of our customers are using actively AI and we are getting this uh, uh, interesting uh, feedback as well. But we, we also build this, like we call it four pillars. You can okay. kind of say it like this. Uh, so beside these four pillars, so um, be beside the problem. So what we did also, we kind of understood the one thing that is super important for our customers. And I believe our poll also confirmed that the, Privacy and security is the number one concern for any okay, Very good, because I just wanted to know that what are the biggest concerns that you are seeing from your customer perspective, not from your end, but from your customer point of view? Exactly you. the same. Exactly as Paul confirmed, exactly, I believe, as many other companies are saying, like, we are concerned about privacy and security of our data. So how, how, how the data is treated. So that's why we actually kind of, we we have a um, handicap here because like every customer that uh, has Avocado, they exist in silo. They have, they have their own database, they have their own cloud, uh, and they kind of doesn't, uh, uh, they do not have any connection in between them. So that's that means that we can actually isolate all the data from every single customer and feed only isolated data to AI, to a specific instance of AI that processes this data and gives some, some answer back. Because that's what solves us uh, the, the 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 problem. So, so very good. So obviously you are a data driven Gen AI uh, uh, or slash AI AI company. So as you are talking about the data, can you also a little bit highlight about this value of the data that that uh, um, you are receiving from your client and so on, or or how much dependency do you have on on the data? Uh, right now, the the uh, funny part that we use pre-trained model. So now we are not training any model on the like specific user's data because there is no need for that. So we combine the best part of two worlds. Basically, we use pre-trained model that knows how to answer questions. 
And then we supply the data from a specific customer for each particular question. But by, by the data, what I mean, and where does the uh, caveat, the difference, uh, what we do maybe with other companies, how they are doing, we are not just like feeding all the documents and what's not. Instead of that, we already have done some homework inside the platform that you do not need to feed the document. You need to feed only the relevant data for that. So we define the data points that are relevant for a particular document, for a particular workflow, for a particular business unit. And then this data, it's much faster to feed. It, it has like much, much better results because it's just- And like I think cleaner. it has a better privacy and security around it as well because you are yeah. not carrying unnecessary data. Exactly, exactly. That that's the, that's the thing. In some cases, we, we can even feed like an uh, anonymized data. So we are feeding uh, data to AI without any personal data. So it's just like anonymized data, here's the data, but there is no personal data fields because you can filter them out. If you are feeding the whole documents, you can do that because like it's it's there, everything in your document, right? In your contract, in your like uh, service agreement or whatever. That's what we call data driven because like from day one, we, we want to have this control to give this control to our customers. So they in control which data is uh, critical for business, which data should be shared, shouldn't be shared uh, across which teams and uh, including across AI applications and and and, and what's not. Very good. Um, as I can see, also you have it in the in the slide. And uh, as I earlier stated, I would like to know where you, as as a business owner, are actually placed because prompting is a new computer language, and uh, the writing, uh, asking the right question is an art. And there are people who are working and developing IP around it. So, so uh, where are you standing in in that particular point? Especially, I see that it's one of your 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 pillars in your strategy. Yeah, as, as a company, we realized one thing that, uh, first of all, building your own LLMs doesn't make sense. Uh, so we, because kind of we work with a pretty much pre-trained model, we do not need to kind of build our model. Of course, we, we need to isolate, as we just discussed about the data, the data we are feeding, the data, how it's uh, processed, the data. Of course, that's that's one thing. But where we add value as a company, as, as a product, and where we see our IP as well, intellectual property, is exactly in how do we prompt how the prompting is built. And I believe this is crucial for every single organization over there. I heard about, about organizations that are actually having prompting libraries. So they're building and constantly improving prompting libraries. What it means that every single person can use a pre-built prompt to solve a problem, but then they can improve. They can kind of tune, to, tune up the prompt and, and say, okay, now it works better because it's all about prompting. Of course, data quality, and prompting because garbage in garbage out this Absolutely. is like a super, super 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 simple model and we see our ip and the value additional value that we are adding on top of this um specific uh model llm for example open ai or llama model or whatever model we use is exactly how do we prompt a specific things to get this data out yeah. John, John, thanks. You know, I, I knew a bit about uh, 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 what you guys are doing, especially I've talked with your AI people, but it was very eye-opening for me to see that how nicely, as a good example of this, this Gen AI you are, you are utilizing, and it's not like randomly, you are actually having things well structured, taking into account the risk and so on. And I would be happy to actually use use um, Avocado as an example of, I mean, good application of generative AI when, when I'm giving the talk. I didn't know that you have that nicely structured thing uh, and it's not random. I mean, everything is uh, need to follow one particular set of rules and so on and so forth. Very good, very nice. G glad to hear that, Shahab. Of course, we can use, if, if, I, if I can provide you with some kind of additional data on top of that, there, there, there is no problem because we, we kind of the company that we, we, uh, we have zero uh, tolerance for like errors. So um, I think uh, that wraps up the main part, but we still have some questions. Oh, another question just arrived. So let, let's take those questions uh, and uh, let's answer, because I, I like the first one. So guys, uh, why does ChatGPT free version think uh, up things? For example, if I ask who uh, who is, and they put my name, I get an answer that uh, I'm the main character in a famous children's book. I mean, the person who asked that question is very lucky because when I ask about my name from GPT 3.5, it says that they absolutely have no clue who that person is. Uh, and I think that it's because um, it hopefully everyone will be very, very well known. And the moment you ask who you are, it says that you are that amazing person. But with high probability, you have similar name or 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 one-to-one -one name to those type of characters that it has read a lot about them. 
I am not carrying any particular name, so that's why that the the uh, uh, ChatGPT 3.5 or any version of that one knows me as as my name, unless that I give extra information about myself to it, so it can it can kind of fine tune and learn it. So so I don't think that that's a bad thing. I have encountered actually with the cases that I have written that yeah, who who is Shahab? I mean Shahab. Oh, we didn't use the name Shahab, somebody, somebody's else name. And it is start to write down that, yes, this is a very famous, I don't know, warrior or a king of that country. And when we search it, we find out that he is not. And we find that this is part of the hallucination that the generative AI was 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 making, especially with the with the older version, which is the free version 3.5 is. The older version has a tendency to do the hallucination more. I think it's super relevant, this question and the answer to this question is super relevant to just uh, the thing that we just discussed about prompting, right? So uh, kind of the, the, the more context you give to AI, the better it is in uh, answering it. Because if I ask who is Jean, uh, I, I actually didn't ask, uh, but uh, I asked who is Jean Maurice with my kind of uh, name and uh, uh, and last name, but it kind of provided me, do you mean this Jean Maurice or this or that or this? And it's like, I'm not even there, you know, kind of <laughs> uh, among those uh, options. But when I ask who is Jean Maurice from Latvia, it answers perfectly. So it, it kind of, it crawls the web and it answers who, who am I, what kind of background do I have? Of course, it most of the time is just like copy paste from some kind of, I don't know, website where well, kind of I participated in the conference. But anyway, so it's all about the context, guys. Uh, all about the context. We have another question here uh, and another one. Uh, in what fields do you service customers? Um, that's uh, that's to me, yeah. Could, could, could I, for instance, ask you to do research on a specific issue? For example, if I need data to substantiate a specific research product. Uh, the short answer, uh, there are like two sides to the question. Of course, we serve customers in like different, we are niche agnostic, but now we are mostly focused on financials, uh, financial service companies, telecoms, retailers. But we are not company that provides services. We provide a platform where you can automate uh, your documents and workflows and what's not. So I'm, I'm not sure. Um, I believe you can message me with uh, some more details, maybe on LinkedIn. By the way, guys, connect with me and Shahab on LinkedIn. We are quite open to accept those connections. And we can continue with uh, those specific questions on uh, LinkedIn. Because th this is like maybe I need more context on this question. So please reach out to me on LinkedIn and let, I'll, I'll try to address it. And there is another question. Hypothetically, could I feed uh, erroneous information about myself and how wonderful I am on the web? And when an AI search come up, I am this expert for purposes of a potential employer AI search. Yeah, okay. uh, I can answer to that one. Uh, you can give wrong data. You can fine tune your model with the wrong data and it will learn that wrong data. It doesn't mean that AI is stupid. Uh, it's just like, it, it follows what you are you are teaching. Um, imagine that uh, you, are, you are reading a book and you start to believe that particular book, right or wrong, this will become your ideology and you follow that particular path. So I cannot say that AI act very, very abnormal. Actually, in the in particular field of HR, uh, one of the big problem has happened since the chat GPT became publicly available. People are writing their, their one page CV and then they are asking chat GPT to hype it and it is hyping it so nice and everybody has now 20 pages of CV and uh, not necessarily lying, but exaggerating the, the, the things that you have. And I have demonstrated in a few uh, uh, conferences, which was uh, focusing on the HR, HR tech, that this is this is actually a very very big big problem, so yeah you can give um, John said it very nicely garbage in garbage out. I mean you can give wrong data it learns wrong and provide you the right information related to the wrong data which is obviously wrong information. Yeah, of course you can do that, but imagine how much information you need to feed it to actually learn that you are that fantastic person if you are not. <laughs> Probably there is, there is some information about all of us. So, and we are kind of two minutes to the end. I believe uh, we uh, answered all the questions, no questions anymore. Uh, we did some polls as well. Uh, guys, the slides with a recording will be available for you and send over. Uh, we have Marit on the call, our uh, team member in Avocado, she will definitely email you some uh, additional information. And of course, you can share it uh, uh, across your uh, teammates with your friends and what's not. 
uh, but I hope that it kind of helped you to uh, get from understanding where the technology as Gen AI is at the moment, what the, the capabilities uh, it has, and of course, like build some kind of understanding how it can be implemented and look at the risk side as well. Do not forget about that. Uh, build some kind of uh, framework inside your organization, how you address those risks, because AI is here to stay. It's, yeah. it's a fact. The question is, will you be able to harness its power? And uh, we just uh, want to make sure you do it in the right way and uh, you do it fast enough and you avoid all these like obvious mistakes that probably we made at some point, Shahab probably made and other companies are also made at some point when deploying AI. I there hope you like it. There is person who has the hands up. Uh, I don't know what's the policy in there. Uh, we we kind of uh, probably they might ask us questions uh, in inside that because we do not do this hands uh, uh, on okay. thing. We have Nur Sabrina Sazali, but uh, I believe, as I said, uh, guys, if you still have some questions or some ideas, we are available on LinkedIn. Both me uh, and Shahab, please reach out to us, uh, and uh, we can talk about uh, your specific uh, uh, AI related issues as well. But right now, I want to thank a lot to you, Shahab, for being here, for sharing your um, experience, your knowledge. Uh, Marita, thanks for like keeping all uh, uh, shaped uh, in the great stuff. And everyone from attendees, thank you very much for being with us. Uh, hope uh, it uh, helps you to kind of uh, start your AI journey or continue AI journey within your organization. Thank you Have very a much. Good day, everyone. See ya. Bye.